Well, just recently, Father Daniel Berrigan died. Now, he might not be a household name to younger uh, Catholics today, but gosh, go back uh, 30 years, 40 years. He was, along with his brother, Philip, also a priest, a household name, and one of the most um, kind of prominent and uh, divisive Catholics on the scene. Berrigan was in the uh, tradition of principled nonviolence, so following people like Gandhi and Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day. And he opposed vehemently America's involvement in the Cold War, in the nuclear arms race, the Vietnam War, etc. Uh, he and his brother were most famous as members of the so-called Catonsville Nine. So they broke into a, um, a draft board, you know, headquarters, and with uh, homemade napalm, they set fire to the draft records. Uh, eventually, Daniel Berrigan was hunted down by the FBI and was arrested for that. And he became kind of a, you know, a, a romantic figure for a lot of people on the, the radical left. Um, as I say, a pretty divisive figure in his time. Some Catholics siding with him, other Catholics thinking he was a very dangerous uh, type. I had a chance to meet Daniel Berrigan. He came to Mundelein Seminary when I was in my early days as a teacher there. It would have been like the mid-1990s. So he was in his probably mid-70s at the time. And a lot of the, the radicalism of his youth had been sort of burnt away. He was actually a pretty calm, uh, serene figure when I met him. Well, we had a chance to have a little Q&A, and, and I asked him about the movie The Mission, that wonderful film, in which Berrigan plays a small role. He, he plays a role as one of the Jesuit you know, missionaries. Well, I asked him about the ending, because you remember from that famous film, uh, the Jesuits are defending this mission they had established, and it was a beautiful, peaceful place, and because of all the machinations of European and ecclesial politics, they were going to shut the place down, and the Jesuits were opposing it. And so when the decisive moment came, the character played by Robert De Niro, who was a Jesuit priest, opposed the forces with violence. Jeremy Irons, who played a Jesuit priest, uh, opposed it through nonviolence, simply walking out with the Blessed Sacrament. But what's interesting is the movie doesn't decide for us because both men are killed and the, village, the mission is destroyed. So there's no clear indication of, oh yeah, that's the right way to do it. It presents the violent resistance to evil and the nonviolent resistance to evil and they're both there, you know. So I asked Daniel Berrigan, I said, well, what did you think about the ending? And he gave me just kind of a, I'd say a weary smile. I said, well, it was the decision of the director. It wasn't my decision. Because I think he would have, you know, clearly said, um, follow the path of, of nonviolence. Well, not long after that, I remember I was at Notre Dame University. And uh, Cardinal Francis George, who's my spiritual hero and mentor, was giving a presentation. And afterwards, he was asked about nonviolence. Because at the time, Michael Baxter was teaching there. Baxter was a disciple of Stanley Hauerwas, who was a great advocate of nonviolent resistance. So it was kind of in the public conversation. They asked Cardinal George, so, Your Eminence, what do you think about nonviolence? And he gave an answer, which I'll confess I'd never heard before, have never really heard since. But it's always stayed in my mind as like the best way to approach this thing. He said, the church needs pacifists the way it needs celibates. Very interesting thing. In other words, both the pacifist and the celibate witness to the eschaton, to the way we will live in heaven. So, celibacy. Jesus says, in heaven we will neither marry nor be given in marriage because we'll be more like angels. We're going to live and love in a way that's not less than marriage, but greater than marriage. So the celibate who eschews marriage here below is witnessing even now to the eschatological fulfillment of human love, right? Now, Cardinal George said, I love celibates. I'm a celibate, but I don't want everybody to be a celibate. If everybody were celibate, the human race would go out of existence, for one thing, you know. So they're there to play a very important witnessing role. In a similar way, he said, people who advocate radical nonviolence have an eschatological witness value. They are living even now the way we will live in heaven. When the lion and lamb will lie down together, we will beat our swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, when all will live in peaceful harmony. Is it that way now? No, but it will be one day. And so it's good even now to have some people who witness to it dramatically. But then he said, just as I don't want everybody to be celibate, I don't want everybody to be a pacifist. What he had in mind there now was the great Catholic tradition of just war, it seems to me, and the maintenance of justice. 
Would it be wise for all police officers to be radically nonviolent? I would submit no. Would it be wise for every politician, every political leader, to be an advocate of radical nonviolence? I would say no, because when certain fundamental rights are threatened, sometimes in this fallen sinful world, the only recourse we have is to violence. You know, bring it down to a more local level. Suppose I walked out of this house and uh, there was someone right in front of my house being assaulted. Well, what do you do? I mean, you don't stage a nonviolent social protest at that point. You take action, you know. So, mutatis mutandis, extrapolating from that, sometimes, you know, police departments and armies and political leaders have to take uh, decisive action. Okay, that's standard Catholic, you know, just war tradition. But what I like about the Cardinal George thing is it doesn't simply pat pacifists on the head, like, wasn't that nice? No, no, it gives them their full due as very powerful witnesses even now to the way God wants us to live eschatologically. And press it further, as I've often argued, properly expressed, the nonviolent uh, resistance to evil is not passivity in the, in the face of evil. It's not just giving in. It's a very creative opposition to evil whose purpose is the elimination of injustice. It's a way of fighting, if you want but it's a very definite um, uh, form. Very good example is John Paul II in Poland, 1979, in the years following, when in the face of the greatest, perhaps greatest military uh, uh, force ever assembled, he effectively opposed it without firing a shot. Without the slightest bit of violence, John Paul contributed anyway to the downfall of this great uh, empire. Can the nonviolent eschatological witness have a real effect in the world? Yes. Look at King in our country. Look at Gandhi in India. Now, in every case, I'd say no. Do we universalize the principle? I would say no. Nevertheless, with Cardinal George in mind, we affirm the importance of the nonviolent witness. So, in sum, as we look back at the life and uh, work of Daniel Berrigan, should we praise him for his nonviolence, I would say, yes, yeah, we should praise him. Celebrate him, yeah, as eschatological witness. But we don't want everybody to be Daniel Barrett.